President. Senator from Rhode Island. The Senator from Rhode Island. I'm here to uh, speak about something else, but let me just take a moment and thank uh, my chairman for what he has done. Um, I had the experience of serving on the help committee uh, with Chairman Alexander and Ranking Member Murray when we did the education bill last year. Education is nearly as fraught a topic politically around here as health care is. And what we saw in a thoughtful, regular order process that was developed under uh, Chairman Alexander's leadership was a very considerable piece of work with real effect. Sometimes we agree on something on both sides of the aisle in this body because there's nothing to it. It's National Peaches Week or something and everybody's for, for that. When it's something big and when it's something consequential, that's where difficulties begin to emerge. And what the chairman was able to uh, work in the committee was something big and something consequential on health care. And to the end of my days in the Senate, I'm going to remember that closing vote when the clerk of the committee called the roll and every single member of the help committee voted in favor of the measure. It came out of committee unanimously. And with that burst of energy, it came through the floor fine. It passed the House without too many uh, changes. And it was just a remarkable piece of work. So I've seen what the help committee can do under Chairman Alexander and Ranking Member Murray, and I am filled with confidence uh, that the process can be terrific there, and I'm filled with goodwill towards a successful outcome, and I just think that uh, it's terrific what the Chairman has said, and I just wanted to say that word of appreciation. Uh, now, Mr. President, I would like to uh, ask unanimous consent to speak for up to 17 minutes, as if in morning business. Without objection. And what I'd like to speak about is a, a new form of fossil fuel funded climate denial spin that has just entered the climate debate. They are always up to something, and here's their latest. The Trump administration's two uh, great scientists, Scott Pruitt, and Rick Perry, the frick and frack of climate denial, have called for a science showdown where climate denial and climate science can have it out for once and for all, red team versus blue team. Fossil fuel man Pruitt has even called for the showdown to be peer-reviewed. Well, <laughs> what's comical about that is that climate science has been peer-reviewed all along. That's how it gets to be science, by going through and surviving the process of peer review by other scientists. I would like to uh, ask unanimous consent to add a letter uh, to Administrator Pruitt from a wide range of scientific organizations pointing out to him this very fact, that climate science is called climate science because it has been through scientific peer review. Without objection. Climate denial, on the other hand, avoids peer review like it was kryptonite. So this call for peer review of the contest between climate science and climate denial is almost comical, except for the evil intent behind it. And of course, the stakes. How very risky and dangerous continuing to get this climate issue wrong is for our country. And I would like to also add uh, at this point an op-ed written by John Holdren, until recently the President's climate advisor, uh, entitled The Perversity of Red Teaming Climate Science. Without objection. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. So let's go back to the basics here. The basic fact of the matter 
is that the scientific truth of climate change threatens the business model of enormous industries that spew carbon dioxide. And it challenges the ideology of right-wing fanatics who spew hatred of government. That's what the background is to all of this. And there has been a scheme for years to protect the industry's business model and the ideology of its associated cohort of fanatics. That scheme from the industry and the right-wing fanatics has been to attack climate science. They have been at it for years. If you're a huge polluting industry or a right-wing fanatic, how do you go about attacking science? Well, you can't win a real attack on the science precisely because the polluter nonsense could not make it through peer review. Peer review is the most basic test to enter scientific debate. But they'd fail at peer review because their argument is bogus, phony. It's a front. So the scheme has always been to avoid peer review because it is a test they would fail. So if you're going to fail the peer review test, what do you do? Instead of a direct attack through peer review journals, they attack science from the side. They create a phony parallel science, a simulacrum of science that doesn't have to face peer review. Their phony science doesn't even have to be true. In fact, they don't care whether it's true or not. Indeed, I contend that some of them know it's not true and are engaged in deliberate knowing fraud. But in any event, getting to the truth is not the point of this phony parallel science. The goal is political, not scientific. What they want is for government, us, to let them keep polluting. Polluting with their product makes them big, big money, and they don't want to stop. So the goal is not to enter the scientific debate on scientific terms. This is no quest for truth. This is a quest to influence public opinion. So the polluter nonsense doesn't have to be true. It just has to sound legitimate enough to influence an uninformed public. The goal is to fool the public and mess with politics. That's how they keep the political pressure off having to clean up their act. Their battlefield is the public mind, and their goal is to pollute the public mind with false doubts about the real science. The climate denial apparatus that Pruitt and Perry serve just needs to create the illusion that there is still scientific doubt. And it just has to create that illusion in the minds of a non-scientific audience, the average voter, people who don't know any better and shouldn't be expected to. To do this, they have set up an elaborate con game to help them foment this illusion that there is a real contest here. Their first trick, of course, is to hide the hand of the funders who back this scheme behind innocent or respectable sounding names. If people saw the hand of ExxonMobil or Coke Industries behind this scheme, well, the jig would be up. So they have to back front groups, dozens, indeed, of front groups. The front groups take nice, cozy words like heritage and heartland and prosperity, and they stick them on the front of the front group. I'd like to uh, add an article uh, called EPA is asking a climate denier think tank for help recruiting its red team 
in this effort at the conclusion of my remarks. Without objection. This article points out that they're actually recruiting one of these phony front groups, Heartland Institute, a group which made itself famous for putting up a billboard comparing climate scientists to the Unabomber. So you know that that's going to be a fair contest between climate science and climate deniers when the group involved is a fossil-funded group that has compared climate scientists to the Unabomber. Of course you want them in the debate, don't you? It's laughable, except for the fact that it's really not. The other thing these groups do is that they go down the shelves of American history and they grab the names of heroes and then they slap those great names onto other phony front groups. Even the great General George C. Marshall has had his name slapped on a front group. I'm a big fan of General Marshall. He is a hero of mine. Winston Churchill called him the organizer of victory in World War II, and the Marshall Plan saved Europe after that war. He won a Nobel Prize deservedly. But in General Marshall's life of dedicated service to our country, he had his share of sorrows. And one of those sorrows was that he had no children. So today, there are no living children or grandchildren to defend his name. Any rascal can put General Marshall's name on a bogus enterprise, and these rascals did. It is beyond low. So the first trick, hide the polluter's hand behind an innocent or respectable sounding name. The second trick is camouflage. They ape real science by setting up groups with names that sound like scientific organizations. So when the United Nations convenes the real intergovernmental panel on climate change, they put up a non-governmental international panel on climate change. They ape scientific activities. If scientific organizations have conferences, they have conferences. If scientific organizations have colloquiums, they have colloquiums. If scientific organizations publish findings, they publish findings. The difference is it's all phony. None of it is peer-reviewed. It's not real science. It's a masquerade designed to give the appearance of science without any of the rigor of peer review and the other attributes of real science. They even ape the publications of real science. I don't have the chart with me here, but there is a publication by the legitimate United States Global Change Research Program that is titled Global Climate Change Impacts in the United States. That's for real. It's real science. Then there is a look-alike publication called Addendum, Global Climate Change Impacts in the United States, that was cooked up by the Koch Brothers-backed Cato Institute. Same picture on the cover, same print, same text, same color, it virtually is a masquerade of the real item. So, the first thing is to hide industry's hand behind the front groups, and the second is to mask propaganda activities <laughs> in camouflage that resembles actual scientific activity without having to pass any tests of scientific activity. The last thing is to run the operation like a marketing campaign, since, well, that's what it is. You wouldn't market soap in peer-reviewed scientific journals, would you? First of all, the journals wouldn't publish it. Second, that's not your audience anyway. Same here. It doesn't do these scoundrels any good to be publishing in peer-reviewed scientific journals, even if they could get their nonsense published there. The people who read peer-reviewed scientific journals know better. That's not their audience. And they know that they will lose in front of a scientific audience. They would shrivel up like the wicked witch. So they want to go right to the public. 
with Madison Avenue quality salesmanship and glossy messaging, marketing their dressed up climate denial nonsense like you'd market a new soap or spaghetti sauce. Go straight to TV, straight to talk radio, straight into the political debate. The notion that the climate denial crowd now wants a scientific showdown, some high noon for climate denial, is ridiculous. First, they don't. We know they don't. They've been dodging away from peer review for years. They want peer review like the Wicked Witch wanted water. So what are they up to? Their gambit is yet another climate denial rhetorical trick to misdirect people to the thought that maybe climate science hasn't been peer reviewed either. Climate science is nothing but peer reviewed. That's how it gets to be science. But this bit of trickery sets up in the unknowing person's mind the thought that climate science might not be peer reviewed. Mr. President. Mr. President, Senator from Iran. I see the majority leader on the floor, and I would like, as a matter of courtesy, to yield to him. Uh, if I may have unanimous consent that at the conclusion of whatever he has to say, the remainder of my remarks get attached to the beginning of my remarks as if there were no interruption. Is there objection? Without objection. I yield to the majority leader. Yeah, I thank my friend from Rhode Island very much. Uh, I'll be brief. I move to proceed to calendar number 174, H.R. 2430. The clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 174, H.R. 2430, an act to amend the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and so forth, and for other purposes. I send a cloture motion to the desk. The clerk report the cloture motion. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, do hereby move to bring to a close debate on the motion to proceed to calendar number 174, H.R. 2430, an act to amend the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and so forth, and for other purposes, signed by 17 senators. I ask consent. <coughs> the reading of the names be waived. Without objection. I ask consent the mandatory quorum call be waived. Without objection. Now, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to executive session for the end block consideration of the following nominations. Executive calendar 61, 63, 162, 174, 194, 246, 248, and 249. The clerk will report. Nominations, Department of Defense. Elaine McCusker to be Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense. Robert Daigle to be Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation. Robert Hood to be Assistant Secretary of Defense. Richard Spencer to be Secretary of the Navy. Ryan McCarthy to be Undersecretary of the Army. Lucian Niemeyer to be Assistant Secretary of Defense. Matthew Donovan to be Undersecretary of the Air Force. Ellen Lord to be Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition. <clears throat> I ask consent to Senate vote on the nominations in block with no intervening action or debate. That have confirmed the motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table in block. The President be immediately notified of the Senate's action, that no further motions be in order, and that any statements relating to the nominations be printed in the record. Is there objection? Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, we just. The, the question occurs nomination and block. Hearing no further debate, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The nominations are confirmed on block. Mr. President, for the information of all senators, we just confirmed eight nominees uh, for the Defense Department. You have a close. Mr. 
Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. So if uh, our frick and frack of climate denial, Pruitt and Perry, had said outright, climate science is not peer reviewed, well, that would be a flat lie and they'd be caught out. So instead, they perform this rhetorical bank shot to just lay that suggestion out there, knowing perfectly well it is false. It's a little like the old, when did you stop beating your wife trick. It lays a false predicate out by insinuation where the fact itself could not be properly asserted. The purpose here like the purpose of all climate denial schemes, is to buy more time for the polluters. Think how long this imaginary process of preparing for climate denial high noon will take. Oh, they could spin this out for years. One thing you can bet, game day will never come. But in the meantime, they've got the craftily embedded lie out there that climate denial and climate science stand on an equal footing and just await peer review to decide between them. That lie can just hang out there leaking its poison into the public debate. I gotta say, who thinks this stuff up? They have made a new art form out of propaganda. Think what a schemer you have to be to think this stuff up. That's the kind of people we are dealing with here. And in this bizarro world, frick and frack hold high office. The problem is that there actually is a judge here. A real high noon actually will come. As the old saying goes, time will tell. When it comes to climate change, the laws of physics and chemistry and biology are at work. The things that CO2 concentrations do in the atmosphere are going to happen no matter what we say or believe about them. The laws of physics do not depend on political beliefs. The chemistry of what happens when seawater is exposed to more and more CO2 is going to happen. And it will follow the laws of chemistry, not our opinions or beliefs. What we humans say, or what we believe, or what we've been conned into believing by the climate denial scheme won't matter at all. Our views, our opinions, are not part of the equation. Fill one room with climate deniers and fill another room with climate scientists and the same chemistry experiment will have the same result in both rooms. Chemistry doesn't care about our opinions. The way trees and animals and fish and insects and viruses and bacteria react to new temperatures and new levels of acidity and new environments, we have no say in. The fossil fuel industry can cow Westerners into silence or even con them into believing the industry's climate denial nonsense, and the bark beetle won't care. It won't even know that the con game is being run. The bark beetle will just keep eating its way up the warming latitudes and altitudes and keep killing pine forest by the hundreds of square mile. What science does for us is give us the ability as humans to understand the laws of science so we can predict what will and won't happen. Science provides mankind headlights so we can look ahead 
and see what the future portends. Turning off those headlights by denying the science or trying to distract the driver so we're not even looking out the windshield, that won't change what's ahead. Whatever is coming at us is still coming at us. We just won't see it in time to steer around it, to minimize the collision, or slow down and soften the impact. We won't have time, because we will have given that time to the polluters. Time is what they want. More time for the polluters to make big money. So all this lying, all this science denial, is actually, truly, an evil thing. And the cleverer it gets with these bank shot, faux high noon, showdown, tricky lies, actually the more evil it is. The people who are behind this are doing a very grievous wrong. They are dishonorable, dishonest, and disgraceful. Time, time will tell us just how wicked they are. With that, I yield the floor.